Hey guys, this is Josh Grison making a Starlink update video for you. I know it's been a couple days, but uh, I noticed over the weekend on Saturday, the Starlink engineers posted a QA, and a uh, they called it an Ask Me Anything session, an AMA on Reddit. And they went through quite a few questions that I've seen come up in the comments in my videos over the last couple of weeks. And I figured I'd go through these and kind of cut out a lot of the the back and forth, especially a lot of the comments, and just dig into the actual question that was asked and what the engineer's response was. So I'm gonna post these and, and just read through them really quickly for those that wanna hear it in audio. And I'll also put timestamps for each question in the description. So if you want, and you don't, if you, if you don't wanna hear every single question or you have certain questions you wanted to hear an answer to, go ahead and look through uh, the timestamps below in the description and go ahead and click on the one that you're interested in hearing and it'll hop to that section of the video. If you want to see the full Reddit post uh, with all the questions and all the comments, uh, there was a lot of questions that the engineers didn't get to. They kind of stopped at a certain point. Um, so it's only about the first, I think, 18 questions that got asked. I'll post the, the link to the Reddit below. So the first question that got asked was, once there are more satellites deployed, how important will it be to have any absolutely obstruction-free view of the sky? So the engineers came back and said, you should think about communication between Starlink dish and the satellite in space as a skinny beam between dishy, which is what they're calling the dish, and the satellite. So as the satellite passes quickly overhead, if there is a branch or pole between the dish and the satellite, you'll usually lose connection. Obstructions generally cause outages and not reduce speeds, which was kind of interesting to hear. We're working on some software features that are going to make this much better and long term, the clearance you'll need is going to shrink as the constellation grows. So this will only get much better. Also, hot short term tip, the satellite clump up around 53 degrees latitude north and south. So would focus on keeping that part of the sky clear as we keep improving this. So that was kind of the, the first question, which I know a couple of people have been wondering about outages uh, and whether we get drop signals and kind of what that's like. I did post my feedback on that based on my location here in Washington, but it was good to see what the engineers had to say about it. Second question, I'm super curious how the Starlink terminal locates the satellites. Presumably it has a built-in catalog of TLEs and or state vectors or some other description of where the satellites are, which it can download from the Starlink network itself. Does it make first contact? Does it use the phased array in a particularly low directivity manner or, or just shout out, hey, can any satellites hear me? I need to know where you are. Does it come with a satellite location preloaded from the factory? Seems unlikely, satellite elements go stale. So the engineers came back and said, good question. The Starlink actually has no knowledge of the satellite when it's powered on. The constellation is updating all the time. So this would be difficult to keep up to date. The Starlink is able to electronically scan the sky in a matter of milliseconds and lock into the satellite overhead, even though it's traveling 17,500 miles an hour. When it detects the satellite, the Starlink hones in on the position and makes a request to join the internet. After that, the dish is able to download a schedule of which satellites to talk to next. And with that, it can point right at the satellites when the time comes. I think quite a few of us kind of had a pretty good guess on how this worked, but it was good to actually get the lowdown on it. Um, you know, it is kind of an interesting thing that they have all these satellites that are in low Earth orbit going so quickly and that it's going to pick up on them one after another and in theory not really drop a signal once you have overlapping coverage. Now, granted, we do see some drops currently because the coverage is not complete, even in the beta testing zone. Uh, once that mesh is built out, which I talked about in my last video, um, once they get all the, the satellites up and in position, the mesh will be built out and in theory you won't get any drop signal. So the third question was, what part of the project invited the most creativity from the Starlink engineers? The answers they provided were actually much longer. So you can see I actually put uh, kind of a truncated version of it. They dove into a lot more detail. So if you want to see that, make sure you go click on the Reddit post. But they, they came back and said, creating Starlink has come with a tons of exciting challenges, but a top few come to mind. Selecting full phased arrays for the satellite and dish was number one. Number two, creating a truly plug and play experience for customers. And number three, we've also had to be creative in how we operate what is now the world's largest satellite constellation. So he didn't quite hone it down to one, he provided three different answers, but I thought they were pretty good. And they, he provided a little bit more detail in the Reddit post. 
Question number four, it actually came up twice. Um, two different people asked it and they actually answered it twice. So I put both questions and uh, both responses in here. Uh, they aren't terribly different regarding the mobile use of the satellites. So there's a lot of speculation as to whether the current hardware could handle a mobile platform using the phased array antenna and existing mechanical pointing capability, or whether more extensive active stabilization would be required. Anything you can share about this would be most welcome, including especially when the mobile Starlink might be a reality. The other question was, will Starlink be supported in a situation where you can move it where you need it? I have a summer cabin that I visit. Would it be okay to move it to the other location when we are there? The uh, engineers came back and the response they provided was, right now we can only deliver service at the address you sign up for with Starlink.com, which is what I've seen based on um, my order and all the feedback I've gotten from Starlink. You might get lucky if you try to use the Starlink in nearby locations, but service quality may be worse. Mobility options, including moving your Starlink to different service address or places that don't have that have an address, is coming once we are able to increase our coverage by launching more satellites and rolling out new software. Mobility options, including moving your Starlink to different service address, is coming once we are able to increase our coverage by launching more satellites and rolling out new hardware and software. So the answer is yes, it's coming, and it looks like it's going to be an option for whatever you want to do with the satellite. Uh, especially once you have global coverage, there's really not going to be anywhere you can't take this thing and get a connection. So that was good news. And I think we're all figuring that, but it was good to hear it because um, I think there was some speculation that, oh, maybe that's not the case because you can't do it right now. Uh, the next question was, any updates about the space lasers? How much, can, how much better can latency be with them? How much better can transcontinental connections be with them? When will real world testing begin? And this is something a lot of people have been wondering about. And I think a lot of people, either they don't know about the lasers. Uh, it's kind of like a, kind of a mystery uh, as to whether the satellites are using lasers or not for most people. But the folks that have heard about it, I think, are kind of split between thinking the lasers are already in production. And it's my understanding that they're not. And so this is about the coming lasers that, uh, that they plan on, on using on future versions of the satellites. I know they're in testing right now. But instead of using um, a satellite to ground station uh, connection every single time, in theory, you could hop between satellites and go much longer, longer distances before hitting a ground station. And because there's a vacuum in space, it, it's going to be a lot faster. So I'll just get into what the response to the engineer was. The speed of light is faster in a vacuum than in fiber. So the space lasers have exciting potential for low latency links. They will also allow us to serve users where satellites can't see terrestrial gateway antennas. For example, over the ocean and in regions badly connected by fiber. So these few folks in like super rural areas where a base station is probably not going to be very close, you're going to need this satellite to satellite laser connection uh, to be in production before you're really going to get good quality services. We did have an exciting flight test earlier this year with prototype space lasers on two Starlink satellites that managed to transmit gigabytes of data, but bringing down the cost of the space lasers and producing a lot of them fast is a really hard problem that the team is still working on. So it's coming. I know they're testing it, but not there yet. Uh, the sixth question that popped up was, how are the efforts to bring down Dishy's production costs going? Can you tell us how much it costs to manufacture? The answer they gave is it's going well, but this is no, about, no doubt one of the hardest challenges we're tackling and there are always going to be ways to improve. So. They've mentioned in Twitter posts and in, in some of the media that's come out that getting the cost down of the hardware is one of the toughest things that they have to, to face, despite launching satellites into space into low Earth orbit. Um, so trying to get the cost down is something that they're focused on, but it looks like they still haven't sorted all the problems out at this point. Um, for those that are wondering, it's $500 for the hardware in the beta. I don't know if they're subsidizing that yet or not, or if that's the true cost of the hardware. My guess is they might be subsidizing that. So um, but I, they didn't provide any details in the question, unfortunately. Question seven that popped up in the thread was, the dish seems to consume a 100 watt at this point, which is pretty great for normal use. However, on most small to medium sailboats, that's a lot of power to be using. Any plans to build out a more efficient system in the future? They had an extra A in there. Uh, I, this is actually a question I've gotten quite a few, uh, quite a few comments on. 
We have a couple of items in progress to further reduce power consumption. We are working on software and network updates to allow your Starlink to go into deeper power savings mode to drop power consumption while still remaining connected to the network. Power reductions are a key item we are focusing on for the future. So the good news is they are going to improve things. It's, it's Tesla and, and SpaceX. So these companies are constantly improving things. In this case, it's SpaceX, but just the way Elon runs his companies, whether it's SpaceX or, or Tesla, it, they like to use kind of an agile development cycle on everything and are constantly trying to improve things. And it looks like, yeah, it does draw a lot of power, but they're going to be working to fix that in the future. And I would imagine because we're in beta that um, there's still a lot of improvements and room to grow. The eighth question that popped up in the thread was, do you have a target latency that you would like to hit in the future? What is the time frame when this goal would be met? The answer they provided was, we challenge ourselves every day to push Starlink to the fundamental limitations of physics. Current Starlink satellites operate at 550 kilometers, where light travel time is 1.8 milliseconds to Earth. The round trip from your house to a gaming server and back is at best four times 1.8 milliseconds at these altitudes or under eight milliseconds. There are many obstacles that get in the way of achieving these latencies. For example, when satellites are not directly overhead, your data must travel through the air for more time. Small levels of packet buffering are helpful for the stable service, but hurt latency. Starlink traffic travels through fiber on the ground. This is an indirect pathway that is 1.5 times slower than the photons in a vacuum. We will continually fight to provide the best latency possible, especially to provide a stable and reactive experience for gamers. And this also kind of relates back to the point-to-point -point laser setup that they talked about in an earlier question. So as they get that built out and any other improvements, the latency in theory will improve, especially once you're talking in areas where latency is traditionally terrible because they don't have good quality connections from a, a land connection. Uh, as many people pointed out, if you have a fiber-based or good land-based connection right now, Starlink's really not the option for you. It was never designed to be that option. It's really about getting um, connectivity that's high, high bandwidth, low latency for people that don't have that as an option. And maybe if they improve things enough over time, it could compete with land-based options, but in the near term, that's not gonna be a realistic thing. The ninth question that popped up was, what wind speeds is the dish tolerant of? How much shelter from the wind does it need? Is this something that you should be taken, this, is this something that should be taken in before a storm or could you mount it on the tail of a flatbed trailer flying down the interstate into a collapsing thunderstorm? How does the presence of occasional strong winds greater than 30 miles per hour affect the projected service ice of the, of the UFO? The engineers came back and said, we definitely don't recommend that you mount it to your flatbed and fly down the interstate into a storm. The dish is not designed for tropical storms, tornadoes act. For high wind events, it's always a safer option to bring your dish inside if you have any concerns. I actually had some comments on this in my last video because I have high winds in my, uh, around my home quite often. I live on a hill in a valley and uh, we get winds to 30 to 40 miles an hour sometimes. So. Yeah, I, I've had it flip on me because I just have it mounted to the ground uh, with the tripod. Uh, so I've put some big blocks on it to kind of weight it down and make sure that um, it doesn't fly away. But at the same time, if it got really rocking, I could see it still lifting off because it's definitely got a, uh, uh, a surface area that's going to be able to catch that wind uh, with the dish uh, on a post like it is. So something to take into account for sure and bring it in if you're not sure because it isn't cheap at this point. The 10th question that came up is, how do you think the speeds we're currently seeing from the beta users will hold up once Starlink goes public and a lot more people are subscribed? The answer they provided was, this is not going to be like your regular satellite internet where it gets way too crowded, like QsNet or Viasat. As we launch more satellites over time, the network will get increasingly great, not increasingly worse. So it looks like they're totally planning on, on making sure to be able to handle whatever capacity they bring onto the network. Now, obviously. This is engineers, uh, they don't have full control over Starlink, but it looks like that's currently the strategy. And so hopefully they keep that promise. The 11th question that came up was, could you settle for the debate over whether the dish has a heater? This is something I reported on. I can tell you it definitely has a heater, it's warm, uh, but I'll go ahead and give you the answer that this, the engineers provided. The Starlink does have, a self, does, does have self heating capabilities. 
to deal with a variety of weather conditions. In fact, we'll be deploying a software update in a few weeks to upgrade the snow melting ability with continued improvements planned for the months ahead. The 12th question that came up was, I live in Canada and then the winters can hit negative 45 degrees Celsius. Do I need to worry about the dish at those temps? The engineers responded with, the Starlink does have self-heating capabilities to deal with a variety of weather conditions. In fact, we'll be deploying a software update in a few weeks to upgrade our snow melting ability with continued improvements planned for the months ahead. Which is kind of what we already knew. But for those that didn't know, now you know. Uh, the next question that came up was, I live in Canada and the winters can hit negative 45 degrees Celsius. Do I need to worry about the dish at those temps? The response from the, en from the engineers was, wow, that's cold. While we performed life leader testing down to these cold temperatures with no issues, the dish is certified to operate from negative 30 degrees Celsius to positive 40 degrees Celsius. So technically, his temperature is out of the operating range, but they have been able to see it work in those temperatures. So if you're really far north, it looks like you're kind of on the bleeding edge of what the capabilities are of the satellite. Maybe that'll improve with time, or bleeding edge of the dish, sorry. So the next question was, do you know what the target date for a fully open, non-invite based release is? Steadily increasing network access over time to bring as many people as possible. Notably, we're planning to move from a limited beta to a wider beta in late January. Should give more users an opportunity to participate. So, looks like uh, a lot more people will get a chance here before uh, too long, just after the new year. So, that's good news. The follow-up question from that one was, data caps. Yes, no, hard limit or fuzzy limit, data tiers, what speed options are going to be offered? The engineers came back and said, at this time, the Starlink beta service does not have data caps. So we really don't want to implement restrictive data caps like people have encountered with satellite internet in the past. Right now, we're still trying to figure a lot of stuff out. We might have to do something in the future to prevent abuse and just to ensure that everyone else gets quality service. So depending on how things go, if they have people abusing the bandwidth, they might end up having to do something, which is generally why I think most ISPs, especially wired ISPs, end up coming up with some sort of data cap. I remember my wired Comcast internet used to have, uh, it was like 150 gigs a month or something uh, for the internet I had. Um, so I think typically you're gonna see at least some sort of data cap, but hopefully nothing significant like you've seen with HughesNet or Viasat, where they throttle you and, and they don't allow you to stream videos at high, uh, high quality and a bunch of other stuff, um, but we'll see. Uh, the next question that came up was, what is the most understood part about Starlink? The answer, the answer the engineers provided was that we have it all figured out. We are super excited about the initial response and the future potential of Starlink, but we still have a ton to learn. So yeah, they're, they're probably some of the smartest engineers around, but they still don't have it all figured out. And they're kind of working through the issues as they come up. Uh, they're trying to do a lot of things nobody's done before. So sounds like... Uh, Kind of what I would expect from a company that's treading new ground or breaking new ground and treading new water. Um, so we'll be curious to see what problems come up next. Uh, the next question that popped up was around networking. I know I've seen this in our comments um, back and forth on a couple different videos. Is Starlink IP4, IPv6, both? Does it matter? I've not seen info about this yet from testers. Uh, I have answered this in some of the comments, I, I believe. I've tried to get to a lot of them, but there has been a lot of comments I haven't been able to keep up on it. Um, the answer the engineers provided is, we're testing out IPv6 now and we'll roll it out soon. Once it's ready, you'll get both an IPv4 and an IPv6 address. IPv4 addresses are, limited, are a limited resource. IPv6 is the future. So, um, I think what they're trying to say there, and based on what I've seen, is it's IPv4 right now uh, for beta testers, but IPv6 is coming. So uh, everything I've seen is you don't have an IPv6 address at the moment. One of the final questions we saw was, how are beta users chosen and what's a good bribe amount? 
And the response they provided was, no bribes necessary. Our goal is to serve everyone eventually. If you really want to help drive that, the best thing you can do is send a great soft is to send great software engineers over to Starlink to help make it happen. So they need more help. And that was actually peppered all throughout the Reddit uh, post. There was many times during the response, they posted links to jobs and asked for engineers and software developers. So if you're an engineer or software developer and you think you got what it takes to be part of the Starlink team and you're interested in, in possibly moving to California or Washington uh, or Texas uh, or Florida, I would you know, uh, apply for some of these jobs because uh, they definitely are interested in hiring um, some of the best talent around. And uh, I did cut those out of all the responses to try to keep it brief, but I thought it was worth mentioning. And you can go see that by looking in the links in the, uh, in the description. The last question I believe we have is, do you have an internal human-friendly nickname for the individual satellites? Who gets to name them? And the answer was, not yet. Any suggestions? So that question was uh, kind of more on the lighthearted side but kind of a good way to end it. That covers all the questions and I hope you enjoyed all the responses and some of the commentary. Please like and subscribe if you wanna see more content and there's some links to some of my other videos if you didn't check those out, like unboxing, testing, um, and going through a lot of the other questions that people have asked uh, over the last couple of weeks. If you have any other things that you'd like to see me talk about or go through, I do have a, a beta testing kit that I can um, do some monkeying around with and uh, so yeah, I'd like to hear from you guys. Please post any questions that you have. I'll try to get to those in the comments. And uh, I do have a couple other videos that I'd like to do here in the near future, doing some online uh, streaming testing with, with Stadia, uh, game streaming testing with Stadia. And I'd also like to do a video on how to connect your Starlink to your own router and doing a custom setup with that. And I'll also be trying to post a video about um, a Starlink to Starlink video call over Zoom. Uh, I'm working on getting a video call set up with another user. And so that should be coming soon too. So any other ideas you guys have or things you'd like to see, just let me know and I'll talk to you guys next time.